Okay, hello and welcome to week three of September RSE. So just let me get started sharing this screen and then bringing the slideshow up. This is like the, the non-smooth part of the transition. So yeah, welcome to week three. Um, we're now just over halfway through the whole of the conference. It's been going extremely well. I'm really enjoying actually sitting back every day and just listening to all of the presentations. There's a fantastic workshop this morning uh, on Streamlit, which is very enjoyable. The YouTube video has just gone up. And yeah, we've got a whole really, really busy week of activities ahead of us this week. So what are we talking about? Well, first, more people keep buying tickets, more people are joining. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to repeat this just because make sure there are new people joining the conference. We have about 340 tickets nearly sent out and it's a large community taking part. So there is a code of conduct. Please do behave professionally. Everybody has been behaving wonderfully professionally throughout this, con throughout this conference. We've had no problems whatsoever, but please do keep that up. Uh, we have the policies. Please do read them if you haven't already. And this applies across the whole of September RSE, so all of the platforms that we are using. Now, if you want to get in touch with us, um, we have many, many ways that you can get in touch with us. So either you can email us directly at conference2021 at societyrse.org. You can get in contact with us via the conference information system. So if you go to that URL on the contact page, you'll have all of the different contact methods sort of listed there. And then also if you go to the September RSE booth in the virtual conference center, you'll see there's a couple of ways of contacting us there. One of them is by posting anonymous messages. So if you do want to contact us without telling us who you are, please do feel, to post, feel free to post an anonymous message. And then there's also a feedback form. So I'm gonna push this more as we're moving into the second half of the conference. Um, so the feedback form basically it gives a very, very quick, it's one minute, um, or probably even less than one minute for you to fill in, and it gives us feedback about how you think this online conference has been going, and it's really important that before you leave September RSE, so sometime in the next two weeks, please do fill this in, because it will really help us with our planning for what's going to happen next year for RSE 22, you know, so tell us what you like, tell us what you didn't like, and we really will listen to this, it's extremely important. So before the end of the conference in two weeks time, please do fill in that feedback form. So what's going on now? Well, obviously this morning we have the Oracle Cryptic Code Treasure Hunt, all of the coins were added to the board. This is running throughout the conference and we had a new set of five coins added every single week at a random time somewhere on a Monday. We are keeping a leaderboard of who is finding the treasure the quickest. And that leaderboard, the lead is changing sort of changing over over and over again. So I was watching it this morning. I am not going to publish it this week. Um, so I'm going to wait until the end of the week before letting anybody know what the leaderboard looks like, because it is changing quite a lot and I don't want to give anything away. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, there was a lot of fun I think people were having this morning. And uh, yes, I am evil and Dr. Note does move around a lot. So when you're talking to Dr. Note and Dr. Note disappears, it is because Dr. Note has moved somewhere else. And yes, uh, maybe it happened when there were lots of people there. As I said, with the Cryptic Code Treasure Hunt, there is a real prize for the winning person or the winning team. And you can take part as an individual or as part of a team and the competitions between maybe RSE groups around the country. There's more information on the Oracle Cryptic Code Treasure Hunt page. Because there are five coins put out every week, even if you haven't started yet, you still have a chance to catch up. So you can catch all of the 15 coins that are there already, and then you'll be exactly the same point as all of the other teams when we get to next Monday and the last five coins come out. And I just want to give a shout out to the person who let me know that they've actually written a parser for the emojis. I'm very impressed that there's a parser that has been written for the emojis to decode, to basically set the program up to begin decoding these codes. And also a shout out to GCHQ, who I know are also taking part in this treasure hunt. And uh, we have been tripping them up a little bit because of Windows and uh, Mac issues in terms of decoding. But I am very pleased to hear that GCHQ software is being used to decode um, the treasure hunt clues. So what else have we got? There's conference merch. So again, if you haven't seen this yet, you're new to the conference, we have tons of merch. Please do go to the link on the website or go to the conference merch shop, um, which is in the virtual conference center, and you will find it there. There's stickers, there's bags, there's t-shirts. I've seen tons of people posting on Twitter and sending me pictures of their things saying, look, I've got my t-shirt, it looks fantastic. It's been really, really good quality things. And uh, some of the money does go to the society. So well worth doing. And you definitely need to have a sticker for your laptop. 
Okay, so we have a really full timetable. What we did with September RSC is we took all of the activities that would normally take place in a three day conference. And then instead of running them in parallel, we spread them out over the whole of the month. This means we have pretty much something happening every day. And indeed, I think this week is probably gonna be one of our busiest weeks. So you'll get lots of value if you attend all of the sessions. Now, if you've missed some sessions, don't worry, we upload everything to YouTube and we upload pretty much as soon as it's available. So this morning's workshop on Streamlit has just gone up now. And I think you should be able to find it if you go onto the Society's YouTube channel, because I think it's finished processing. But also to help you, maybe there's, I mean, I know there's like more than 24, 25 hours worth of material now on YouTube. You know, maybe you want to just go for the highlights. We do run a summary talk at the end of each week. And on that summary talk, I try and pick out my highlights of the week. Again, apologies to those of you that I don't pick out. I can only do one thing, otherwise I've repeated the entire conference. But there are so many great things going on through the conference. And then if you want to know what's happening today, just go to the Today page, which is on the conference information system, and it will tell you what's happening today. Or, of course, there's the timetable as well. So what's coming up this week? Well, as I said, this is you know one of our busiest weeks. So already this morning, we've had the uh, Streamlit workshop, which was fantastic. Kind of like if you haven't heard of Streamlit, it's a bit like... Um, Oh, the one for R that I can't just R shiny. So it's a way of building those kind of interactive websites or apps for the Python universe. And it very, very good workshop. It took you all the way through from the beginning all the way to the end of how you do it. Uh, very, very patient instructor. So I do recommend that video. But this afternoon, after I finish doing this introduction, we have a discussion, which is, is testing overkill for most research software? Again, I think this is going to be a very interesting discussion um, because I suspect there'll be differing opinions on this. So remember, with the discussions, um, there's no audience interaction. You're just listening to them talk. But please do go over to the September RSC channel on the RSC Slack and feel free to have a side discussion at the same time as the main discussion is going. Now, on Tuesday, um, we have workshops in the morning. And then we also have a presentation session five, which has no computing on a dead planet, the launch of the RSE mentorship scheme and highs and lows of building a data sharing platform. And we also have poster and lightning talks. So there's tons of stuff going on on Tuesday. Wednesday, this is a very special day for the conference. So on Wednesday, we have RSE Worldwide. RSE Worldwide is where we're going to be bringing together lots of RSE groups and associations from around the world to join us on one big day in the conference. Now, because this is coming from all over the world and we cannot possibly schedule a session which is good for everybody. What we've done is we've broken this into two sessions. So there'll be a session in the morning at our normal conference time, I think from 10 till 12, and then in the afternoon from two till four. And those two sessions will link together in somehow and we'll have this wonderful sort of like bringing everybody together. So please do come along and join this. It's a way of bringing all of the RSEs across the planet together for one, one big event. And it should be very enjoyable. Then Thursday, this is a very full day. We have our Ninja GPU walkthrough where you'll learn how to, you don't have to be a Ninja GPU coder. Then we have the RSCs in, advanced, in AI, ML and HPC panel. Where we'll be talking about RSCs working maybe in non-traditional areas and also the AI and ML areas. And then there's gonna be a presentation session in the afternoon, which is gonna be themed around all of the RSC responses to COVID-19. So again, if you look in the timetable, you see some wonderful talks that are gonna be sort of given through that afternoon. And then Friday, Friday is our regional RSE groups workshop day. Please do come along to kickstart a wealth of regional RSE activities. So we're very keen. So this is basically after a paper that went into the society. There's this recognition that there's this gap between local RSE groups within institutional university and the national RSE society. And there's a need for basically regional groups to kind of come together and organize regional events. And the aim of the regional RSE groups workshop is to really nucleate those new regional groupings. There's a poster which is in the conference center, which enables you to try and identify your regional group. So basically you put your pin in the map and you say, what region do you think you belong to? And then from that in the workshop, there'll be some breakout rooms and people will divide into regions and begin to see how we can maybe create these regional RSE groups and sort of then bridge the local to the national, which I think would be pretty cool. Other things to note, well, we have next week on the 28th, the, this very interesting workshop, which is actually going to be blended. So this is where we're having a competition between teams that will be based in Bristol, Cambridge, London, Manchester, Oxford and Sheffield. And there'll also be an online team as well. And it's going to be very interesting. You have a data set you have to analyze. 
Um, and because it's going to be in person, there will be actual pizza. And I believe there are drinks as well. And there's going to be real networking and an evening event as well for this. And if you want to join this, then please do go to the Open Data Workshop page on the conference information system. Or I think I'll be showing you the link in a sec as well. The other thing to note is if you haven't met Dr. Note already, then Dr. Note is a strange robot that has been seen lurking behind various trees in the virtual conference center, and Dr. Note will move around randomly. So if you can't find Dr. Note, then look around some more trees and Dr. Note will be there. So the open data workshop that I mentioned, you can see here, there's the link to uh, access it. Again, it's on the conference information center. Please do sign up to it. I think it's going to be a fantastic event. The other thing that we have is that we have the Microsoft booth, which is now in the conference center as well. So this appeared on Friday night. So there's lots of interesting things to explore on the booth, as you can see with the reactor and various other things that they've got. So please do and go and have a check that out. And then, as I said, we released the coins this morning. It was like, as I said, I, people tell me that they were just checking randomly themselves, but given that we had this mass of people suddenly appear on Monday morning, almost the instant I click publish, I'm sure there must be some cheating going on somewhere where people are watching when I put the coins on the thing, because it's amazing how quickly everybody appears. Um, but, you know, everything is cool there. So as I always say at the end of these, welcome to the week sessions. The conference is going brilliantly. I'm really enjoying it. I hope you're enjoying it as well. But let's really engage with this conference, network with each other, engage with the virtual conference center, chat to each other and really make September RSE more than just a sum of its video sessions, make it the best RSE conference that you've ever attended. So with that, I'm going to just finish screen sharing. And then what we're going to do is just give a very, very short break to let people connect. So I'll do like a two minute break and then we'll get started with the uh, workshop. So with the discussion on is testing overkill. So we'll do a two minute break and then we'll be back for that.
Right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kristen Merritt, and I've been working with the discussions and panelist uh, team. Uh, with me uh, volunteering today is James Womack. Today, we're going. To, we're very excited to have our next discussion: Is testing overkill for most research software, and how can we make it easier to test scripts? Leading today on as a chair for our discussion is Graham Lee. Graham, I'm going to hand these things over to you and enjoy this discussion. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Kristin. Uh, so yes, welcome to this session. I am uh, unable to start my video, so you just have to guess what I look like for the moment. Uh, I am joined by uh, Doug, by Alison, by Magnus, and by Benjamin. I'm, uh, and this is what I look like. There we go. Uh, all successful. Um, so the th it was the first bit. I will admit the first bit of the um, topic. That, uh, that sort of enthused me about joining in this discussion. Is testing overkill for most research software? Because yeah, that's quite a sort of contentious uh, starting point uh, amongst many RSEs, I would imagine. Now, in a past life, I was the author of a book on um, test-driven software for uh, iOS developers using an ancient dinosaur programming language called Objective-C that you know, many people may not have uh, come across. Um, so, you know, I, I you may be able to tell which side of the, uh, the the fence I'm going to come down on, but I'm, I'm going to ask uh, each of the uh, panelists in turn to introduce themselves and to give um, you know a brief couple of sentences on this first question: Is testing overkill uh, for most research software? So um, let's go in the order that I introduced you earlier. Doug, do you want to go first? Certainly. Thanks very much, Graham. Uh, my name is Doug Mulholland. I'm with the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. It's about five after 10 in the morning here, so I'll say good morning. Um, I understand it's afternoon somewhere else in the world. Um, our research group is a software engineering research group. We tend to take on, I'll call them real world problems, and try to demonstrate that a particular facility or capability can be met by mostly doing it or working with others. Uh, right now, my main focus is environmental information systems. We get data from dozens of partners in our area and amalgamate it and, and work to make that data more accessible to other researchers in the sector, uh, wherever they choose to be. With respect to testing, um, I'm a pretty passionate more testing is better testing type of person. Um, I gave a presentation back in 2017 at the second RSE conference in Manchester. Uh, actually, it was their uh, Workplace uh, Sustainability Software Institute session over there. Uh, one of the things that struck me about both the RSE event and the sustainability group, people were quite open to talk about where things had gone wrong. And at most conferences and events that I go to, people are happy to talk about their successes and where things work perfectly every time. That's an idealized world. The real world is much more in the weeds, in the mud, up to my backside in alligators, uh, deadlines galore, everything like that. That's more the real world that I experience, even in a research environment. Um, and I, I've never heard anyone say, I tested that too much. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. Thank you very much, Doug. I mean, it's, it is interesting that you know, hopefully uh, sufficient testing can save us from the alligators. I would have thought you know, maybe a bit of running would come in helpful as well. Um, next up is, uh, is Alison. Would you like to introduce yourself and uh, take a stab at that first question, please? Hi, um, so my name is Alison Clark. Um, I'm a research software engineer at Durham University. Um, I've been here at Durham for two years. Uh, before that, I was a software engineer in industry in lots of different domains. Um, I did bits of infrastructure work, but most of what I did in industry was uh, web and then mobile development. Uh, so that's sort of where I'm coming from from this. Um, so my sort of quick answer to the question is, is no, <laughs> I think, you know, some testing is needed in, I would say, every case of, of research software, but it's that sort of the level and the type of testing that will needed will, will vary depending on 
on what the software does and who's using it and, and how it's used and how critical it is in, in other things as well. Right, thank you very much. Uh, and next up, Magnus, um, do you want to give an introduction and a, a go at this question about overkill as well? Right, uh, I don't seem to be able to switch on my video, so uh, never mind. Um, so you also just have to imagine what I look like. Yeah, well, never mind. Um, so I'm, I'm Magnus Hafton. I'm from the School of Geosciences at the uh, University of Edinburgh. I've been an RCE for, for quite a while. So in my current post, I've been 10 years or so. And I'm working on well, both embedded systems, collecting data, uh, that be sort of it's a little Raspberry Pi with uh, spectrometers attached to it, and we send them into the air using drones, which is quite fun. To sort of uh, HPC stuff, working on Archer two and so on. So all sorts uh, of sizes and all sorts of problems. And uh, I guess the short answer again is yeah, absolutely. Uh, testing is absolutely required. And uh, I think the sort of more nuanced bit is, is also it really depends on the complexity of the problem. If it's of a, a, a few line script, then it, you run it for, and you run it for yourself. You, you can see what, what happens pretty much straight away and it's not so much a problem. And if it is a project, a large project with lots of functions and classes, then you, you will need to use some form of unit testing and end-to-end -end testing. So I would say in general, yes, uh, but obviously it also depends on size and complexity and audience. Great, thanks for that, uh, Magnus. And uh, finally, we come to uh, Benjamin. Do you want to... Uh cover the same ground, uh, quick intro and uh, response to this idea that testing might be overkill for some research software. So good afternoon, everybody, apart from Doug. Good morning, Doug. Uh, I'm Benjamin Mummery. I have been a research software engineer with the SDFC's Hartree Center for the past three years. And prior to that, I was an astrophysicist writing some of the worst scientific code you have ever seen. So I've kind of been on both sides of the fence here and I like this one more. I'm going to be really controversial here and agree completely with everything everybody else has said. Testing is basically never overkill for scientific code. Uh, I would actually go further and say that the simple act of thinking about how to test the code you are creating is in and of itself enormously beneficial because it helps codify kind of the inherent process of you write code, you run it to see how it works. You know, you're always actually testing anyway, but you can always make it a more efficient system. So there you go, everyone. Uh, everyone agrees that testing is not overkill. There's uh, tea and biscuits back in the foyer. Thank you for coming. And uh, we will see you uh, at um, the RSC conference next year. We, no, okay, we're probably better uh, continue with uh, some discussion there. Um, so yeah, what what I took from that was that um, you know we've got a lot of different uh, backgrounds on this um, on this panel, and particularly a lot of different contexts. You know, we've heard about uh, sort of web and mobile development, about you know sort of solving very scientific problems versus you know, uh, quotes real world problems, uh, embedded uh, HPC scientific code, user-facing code. So I'm wondering whether there are like sort of different um, cultural uh, you know, sort of ideas about what testing is or whether testing is appropriate that come from these different communities uh, of researchers and of RSEs. Uh, so uh, does anyone want to sort of you know, perhaps uh, uh, you know, respond to, to that or give examples of um, you know, sort of cultural either like enthusiasm for or reticence towards testing that you've encountered in particular communities? I guess I, I could start so because I, I've 
I started from um, a research computing site and at the beginning, and I started with Fortran and there, there was, there's no real unit testing frameworks at, at the time. And uh, a few years ago, I, I started on, on a project uh, with, with some C code um, for IO, sort of the underlying IO routines. And I decided, well, I should give that unit testing stuff a go. And I did, and it, it was very cumbersome. And, and so I had these, these accessors and I thought, well, I might as well have test my accessors. And lo and behold, I found lots of errors in that uh, because there's of cut and paste problems. And so that, that really showed to me, this is really extremely useful. And, I, and since then I've, I've been using unit tests where, wherever I can. And it's, it's really, really sensible thing, but it, it did take a, a little bit of convincing uh, myself as well. And uh, Benjamin, I saw you um, unmute at about the same time. Did you also want to come in on this point? Yeah, so coming from the kind of academic background, there really wasn't even a discussion of testing in my sort of academic education. Like we got taught some basic stuff on how to write code, but everything else was a kind of top down, figure out just enough to make it work. The only thing that matters is the end result. And the underlying assumption there is that if you understand the problem well enough and you're writing your code well enough you actually don't need to test because you know why why would you doubt your own amazing skills as a scientist and it's certainly been a real revelation coming out of that and into a world where actually you do have to kind of view code aggressively but you have to doubt everything is broken until it proven until it's proven to work and actually putting more thought into what is the process of writing code? Because I would argue that all code writing is fundamentally test-driven development because you have a, you start with an intent and you write your code until it matches the thing you pictured in your head. So it's, it's transitioned for me from the only thing that matters is the end result to testing is an intrinsic part of how you develop code and having an organized framework just makes it easier. I think you, you brought up a, a sort of important uh, point there that, that scientists are kind of thinking about, well, you know, I know what my model is and this code realizes that model. And therefore the question is, you know, what is my model doing? And is that correct? And find that difficult to, um, to separate from the question of does my code even implement that model correctly? And that this is, something you can get from testing the software. Um, but I'd like to bring Alison in at this point because you, know, you talked about doing web and mobile development. So you've got very different uh, sort of um, context and goals. You know, you're building software for other people, not necessarily for like you know, yourself or your peers within your research group. How does that change the sort of relationship with testing? Yeah, I think sort of because I would be coming from, from that aspect, um, my sort of... Um, my take on this was always yes let's test as much as possible let's try and make sure we've got as much code covered as possible so that you know if you make any changes you know that things aren't broken but then i took that attitude and applied it to something that was more research code just to be used by two or three researchers and i think that was overkill um because i think i spent a lot of time just sort of doing defensive programming against invalid inputs where actually you know if they type something wrong on the command line, they could have just said, what's going on here? And we could have answered them and that might have taken less time than, um, than all of the defensive programming. But then we're making that code public now. So having the defensive programming is probably a good thing. And having all of the tests that made sure that things didn't die if you put the wrong command lines in, uh, command line parameters in, maybe that is okay. But I, it's, it's trying to find that balance between spending time writing tests that might not be necessary because this does not have to be perfect. It doesn't matter if it occasionally crashes for someone versus so on, you know, on a, on a program that's might be run by a handful of people ever versus sort of um, something where you just, you don't want it to break because 
you know, that could be a lot of people who are trying to access something and it's suddenly everything's gone down because something wasn't didn't do as you expected it. So I think there's quite a different sort of context. And I think that that's something that I've sort of had to learn coming into to the research environment. Is that, that not everything needs quite that level of testing that, you know, a website with <laughs> however many users needs. Yeah, that I mean, that there's sort of a, another point in there as well, like you know, taking on board your question, your idea that like, not all code needs testing in the same way or like you know not all aspects of the software need to be tested you know with the same rigor or to the same extent there's also the point that like when you're sort of early in the stage of research and you know, development of an idea you want to be a bit more experimental you want to change things more frequently so you, know, you perhaps adopt a process that doesn't have so many tests and you aren't encapsulating every aspect of the behavior in the test but at some point later you are using this thing that you developed in that way and at that point you want it to be you know quite stable and quite robust and uh, and able to be maintained in a uh, in a reasonable way which means that you want those tests so you go from wanting to not write tests at the outset because they're going to slow you down to wanting to have already had some tests written so that you know how to maintain the thing and there's a question about like where in that transition you change your process and whether you're even sort of conscious of doing that. Um, yeah, did, does anyone on the uh, panel, Doug? We haven't heard from you in a while. Have you yeah, had? Uh, I'm jump in on that because your yeah, sure, please do. Me sounds a little bit contingent on the the print the notion that testing is hard. And on the one hand, I'm inclined to agree. On the other hand, it shouldn't be. And so the question is, what do we have to do to make it easier? And I'm a firm believer that it should be as easy as possible. That when you look at a piece of code you've just written, you sort of think, okay, now what inputs, con configurations, settings, parameters, whatever it is, will test these boundary cases that I coded into this little if statement with a less than, and, and I struggled over whether it should be less than or less than or equal, all this kind of stuff. Let's throw those zeros, non-zeros, less than zero, greater than zero, whatever it is, at this function and see how it behaves. Um, did I really think through the model adequately to, to, to get a handle on that statement? Now, that is after that function is initially written, of course, for sure. I'm not saying, well, I'm about to write another if statement. Oh, I got to put the test in. And we can argue over test-driven development versus uh, testing. I'm, I'm perfectly on board with test-driven development, writing the test first kind of thing. I'll just take a moment to mention in our environment, we do develop quite a bit of uh, online systems embedded, and not so much embedded, but uh, online definitely, uh, mobile uh, and modeling stuff as well a little bit. But we, whenever possible, drive it through a web interface. And I have a whole testing framework using Selenium grid servers and automated browsers and whatnot that can pump all kinds of tests in a hurry at this code. All I got to do is enter the data, configuration parameters, whatever it is, set up that context, boom, run it, and, and it's, it's good to go. And in particular, it's good to go repeatedly um, as I continue to develop other things around it, framework settings, the bigger pieces of this thing, I can rerun these original tests. Did I break something? Oops, yes, I did. Um, or no, it's all good. I can configure this thing to run daily if I want. So, you know, a, a week from now, I've forgotten about this little routine, but the test didn't, it's still running. And it pops up a little message in my inbox in the morning says something went awry with this. And you have to go back and, and, and check it out and see what you did break that affected this kind of thing. And the concept there again is testing should be, and, and there are ways hopefully to make it easier. Um, just as a little sidebar, we call this whole project on, around our testing environment, the uh, Casablanca project. Because the most famous line that was never spoken in a movie 
came from Casablanca, play it again, Sam. He didn't say that. He said, I thought I told you never to play it again, but play it again, Sam, is a great line for a testing framework. <laughs> so making well, it as easy as possible is what we're about for, um, yeah. for testing. We'll, fi we'll find that our, uh, that our code passes all the tests, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but Sunday. Um, just to quote the other line from that film. Uh, so you brought up, and it's it's lucky that you did, because you know, th this is the other question that we have advertised on the title of this session. So if we get this one out of the way, we can then just have a chat about whatever we want for the remaining uh, you know, time of the session. So um, you brought up, uh, how can we make it easier to test? And we, we specifically, uh, the, in the title, we ask, how is it easier to test? How do we make it easier to test scripts? But you know, let's look at sort of research software more generally. What is it that people find hard? Is it the technology? Is it the thinking about their software in the way that makes uh, testing you know, easy or hard? Uh, is it um, designing their implementation such that it's testable? What experiences do um, you folks on the panel have of doing that? And welcome to um, the face of Magnus as well. So may, maybe I'll, I'll say something. So I, I think the, the unit testing frameworks, they're fine. Uh, there are some, some tools that are really cool. I really like hypotheses. Again, um, in, for Python, throwing sort of uh, edge corners at, at, at your function and, and that sort of discovers some bit. So that, that's really cool. The thing I, I struggle more with is when you don't have sort of an isolated function that you can sort of easily test it's sort of when you when you have sort of a bigger problem say you you've got an entire model run and you need to figure out what does it mean to test this thing um so say you you've got a climate simulation right and so how how do you test that thing do you test it against other models what what is truth here so how can you verify it? And so and I think that that's also where, where I'm quite interested in how, how to do that. So I, I worked on, on some uh, ice sheet models in, in the dim and distant past, and, and there was sort of specific um, uh, uh, routines uh, or, or models generated that are not interesting, but you you could have an exact solution for those. So you construct your test cases with that. And so for these issues, I think it, it's, it's really difficult and, and a lot of thought uh, goes into it. So, so I think in, in general, there, there's two different kinds of, of problems that you want to test. Like one is like, if I store this value, do I get it back? That's one sort, and the other one is of the scientific one. I've get this. I've got this complicated thing. Did I get all my science right, for example? Or, or uh, and and that's that's. A, I think that requires a different approach. In that sort of scenario where you've got the complicated thing, how often is it? How often is it made? Is that complicated thing made up of smaller things that you can test? Um, is it? Is it? Are you talking about cases where? You, you can't test the individual parts of it in a sensible way or is it that would, would it be the case that if you had split things out and separated uh, tested little bits of it that you would, would have more confidence in the whole i so i'm, I'm trying to think back um it's so you, you you've got so going back to the ice sheet model so that that was quite quite a lot of code there, so you you've got your discretization. Um, you you uh, encode your your math somehow, and 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 you you only notice the, the error at the end. And and so I'm thinking back to another problem. Um, I noticed that uh, one of my models was out by five percent from what it should be, and we're looking for a two percent signal. And it, it took me months to take this whole thing apart. And I, I went through all the discretization 
and all all the stuff. And in the end, if I remember correctly, I found the error. It, it was obviously the wrong sign, but it was because the I, I computed a cross product in a left-handed coordinate system, and it, that so that flips the sign, and and it, sometimes like spotting these errors you, you have to be lucky and have to have be switched or look at the problem in the right way I was not and and yeah and then I guess once you know that sort of thing uh, you you can you can test for that but again so in in this case I did have my tests there and and the, the other problem obviously it, it takes age or it can take ages to run the tests um, just because these simulations take take a long time um, to run. So I think there's a really good uh, analog between scientific code and scientific calculations. Because if you're sitting down to compute, I don't know, what's the gravitational force on the orbit of Neptune or something, how do you check your result? Or you go back over all of the steps and you say, did I do this step right? And then you look at all of the steps and say, do these steps make sense? Is this the right pattern? And the second one of those is a kind of a design question in terms of did you construct your code correctly? And the first one is unit testing. So I mean, this is something that we do get a lot of resistance on when we're talking to people about, you know, we want you to do testing and they say, well, I don't know what the end result of this thing is going to be. Like there's no analytical number I can compare this output to. I was like, well, then you're trying to test something that's too big. You need to chop it into pieces. Um, I also want to revisit something, uh, Doug, you brought up about the view of testing as being hard, uh, which is it, it isn't as long as you start early enough. What's hard is adding it back in if you've skipped it. And I would also say that uh, a comorbid problem is viewing testing as separate. Because I don't think it is. I think testing is fundamental to how you write code. Like None of us has ever written a few lines of code and then not just run it just to see what it does. Just to do that little sanity check. Well, that's unit testing, right? Like None of us has ever you know, written something and handed it over without running it a few times with a few silly numbers in just to see. So it's it's taking that impulse to kind of iterate and check and saying, what if you did this scientifically and wrote it down as you went? <laughs> and then automating it so that it doesn't take up too much of your time. So to answer the question of, you know, how do we make testing easier to do, set it up straight away. Like, Whenever you start a new repo, whenever you start a new project, get your Git hook set up. Just get something in place. Doesn't matter if it doesn't have anything in it. Just as long as you've got somewhere you could put a test if you wanted one. And then when you, you know, when you've written your piece of code and you go and have your coffee break and you look at it and you go, eh, I've got five minutes. I'll just like a little test there. And then because you've automated it, you get your regression testing going. So you spot the problem that you accidentally caused a month down the line. And you don't have to go back to your block of code and try and remember exactly what you were thinking when you wrote it. Or even worse, try and figure out what the other person who wrote it was thinking. That that sort of uh, brings up the uh, the problem of awareness, because you know, you've got to know that this is something that you need to do and is worthwhile and is going to give you value at the point of inception of your project but many uh you know so certainly the researchers i've worked with uh, where they are writing their own software um you know so where like i'm joining their group to help with their software problems rather than you know writing something that they need um you know, uh, they're typically sort of self-taught or you know taught in a very sort of craft fashion from master to apprentice you know from prof to postdoc to default student and this is why we see you know uh, it's like such sort of varieties in tools and techniques right you know like a, a, a physics group may be very very heavily 
Fortran based and maybe even sort of heavily Fortran 77, just because at some point in their past, their code got ported from punch cards and typed into VI, you know, but like a billion years ago. And that's still the way in which their um, PhD students are taught to write software. But another group may be very MATLAB focused or another group may have like started their code in the Java times. And so you've got a lot of object oriented Java code. Um, so what, what, how can we, as the sort of often local software engineering experts, you know, from not only from a perspective of knowing software, but also knowing what we know about how we make software, how do we get that argument in place? How do we get that sort of awareness that there is ease, is even a problem that you need educating about? You know, uh, like, uh, yeah, I'm going to stop there. How, how do we actually make this thing happen? So there's a concept called software stamina, which is about uh, how you kind of do good design over time, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. There is an analogous concept for testing stamina. So if you launch into writing your code, yeah, you can make much more progress early on by skipping thinking about testing. You've just got more time to put towards adding features in. But there inevitably comes a point where you're trying to add a new feature, but you've got to deal with all of the technical debt that's accrued of all of these little things that just never got fixed or were placeholders, like the stuff that you're like, ah, oh, doesn't really matter. Like, I'm not going to worry about this too much. So over time, your progress slows down and slows down and slows down. And each new thing is not only more complicated to do because you've got to deal with the accrued technical debt, but adds to it. So the next thing is even harder. So there is a, a point where the well-tested, well-designed code catches up and things just flow a lot more easily because everything's got like doc strings or unit tests or just something that tells you how this thing should operate and will indicate if it's wrong. So yeah, if you are writing something that you are going to run and discard, and you're the only person who's ever going to need to touch it, you can live below the payoff point and just crank out code and then ditch it. If there is the slightest chance that you're going to need to build something more complicated on top of this, this will make your life easier. I was going to jump in and ask sort of, uh, how, how much research code do you think would fall below that point um, where it's not necessary? So where, where the payoff, where you don't get the payoff. Uh, if you were thinking of writing it on scrap paper, it falls below that layer. I would argue anything else. If, if you're going to keep it, there's the possibility you're going to build something else on top of it. So stick a test or two in it. I, I think one, one issue is um, legacy code. So you, you inherit sort of a big big body of code and then having to troll through it figuring out tests is uh, is quite well quite tedious really um, and so as, as you said uh, starting starting early is you know it's it's ideal and then it's also fresh in your mind but a lot of the time we just don't have the luxury of of doing that and and maybe that that is I don't know you, you just, I guess, you, you just have to bite the bullet and decide if if you're going to to uh, if you're spending lots of time on it. And yeah, adding the tests is worth worth it. I mean, I guess there is a question of whose problem is this likely to eventually become. So you could make an argument if you've got a limited amount of resource and a deadline to meet the it's maybe viable to punt this problem down the road to the next poor sap. You are going to have to take the gamble on that sap being you, though. Like the, the best time to start testing is immediately, and the second best time is now. So maybe the um, short fixed term contracts we have in academia aren't actually that conducive towards uh, writing quality software. But like, even those, like, 
yeah, the upfront cost is going to be high to go back and put testing into your legacy code and fix the various problems it has. But it will pay off in the long run because you're then being a lot more efficient later down the line. But it's kind of the, um, you know, politicians are in office for four years, so why do they bother fixing problems longer than that? It's that kind of question. And so I think there are times when testing can actually make your coding faster. So if instead of sort of running your script 20 times, your entire script 20 times with different inputs to check, you know, to check something, if you've got a unit test that runs those 20 times automatically for you, that can actually be quicker than than running the whole thing if, if you want to check some of those edge cases. So I think sort of using that sort of trying to emphasize the advantages as you're coding, that can be a good sort of uh, carrot to, to try and um, throw at people to, to, to encourage them to, to, to unit test that actually, although it, it you know, that sort of the initial hurdle of sort of writing your first test can feel like a big one to jump to get over, but actually once you've got there, then okay, I'll just chuck another test in here just to check what happens if I do this, can actually make things a lot speedier than trying out your code lots and lots of time if you've got quite a long, complicated bit of code to run. Yeah, I think really hitting the point of like testing is something you already do in an ad hoc fashion. Everybody does it, but putting the little bit of time in at the beginning to think about how you do it means you can do that a lot more efficiently. Yeah, I just wanted to add, we had a project handed to us some stream simulations and modeling, and it was 20,000 lines of visual basic code and we were said, make this suitable for the web. And in, in testing it, we found about three different things. One was it was a very chaotic model, meaning in one context, we tracked it back and I was observing the 17th digit in binary of a floating point number, double precision was out by one bit, machine epsilon kind of thing. And just that discrepancy blew up by the end of the simulation to tons and tons of extra nitrogen or phosphorus being carried in this stream. And that's what the chaotic aspect of this thing, like this tiny little discrepancy resulted in a huge errors. Fortunately, those numbers didn't really matter too much, but there were other places where stream temperatures were being reported. And on top of that, it was all masked by smoothing algorithms and the original author of this particular piece of code was smoothing by a factor that had nothing to do with what they were supposed to be doing instead of one pass through all the numbers and smoothing out temperatures and gram, kilograms of nitrogen and phosphorus and so on, they were going through the number of segments of stream that feed into certain tributaries and, and um, different level segments of a stream ultimately going into a lake. And the number of times the smoothing was going on was enough to collapse irregularities in the data calibration was in place. So regardless of what the model predicted, it couldn't escape the calibration constraints in this model. And by the time we sort of undid some of these things, I found, well, the base model was predicting a stream in Ottawa, January, 107 degrees Celsius. And the last time I checked, there's not a lot of volcanic underground streams in the Ottawa area of Canada. Uh, hasn't been an earthquake in about a half million billion years, but um, when we put one level of smoothing on, okay, it came from 100 Celsius down to 50 Celsius, but after 17 layers of smoothing, it was just a slight blip on the equation. It undermined our entire conference confidence in working with this code, working with this organization, the whole shebang. Now, we managed to get things back on the rails, but um, it had significant implications when they hadn't done the level of testing that and the fellow had the nerve to ask me to my face, how could it possibly be wrong? Because all of this calibration was in place. Well, that's one of the common errors in, in modeling these days is yes, they calibrate to reality, but they calibrate so tightly 
that the model can't possibly influence the outputs adequately to, um, to really produce a desired result, anything other than what was measured in last year's rainfall, for example, um, how the streams behaved. Um, so that's been a fairly common criticism of modeling systems these days and just an alert to folks to have the radar up when people talk about calibration. I mean, that, that reminds me of what a, uh, a wise person said recently, which is that, you know, if we do the tests, then we get the cases. And if we, uh, you know, so if we don't want to get all the cases, we just don't do the tests. And I wonder whether there is, a, you know, an aspect of that sort of thinking in some projects where, uh, you know, we, if we don't uh, watch the software and we don't um, test the software, then we don't find out that everything's wrong. And so it doesn't impact our publication schedule. It doesn't impact on our uh, results and so on. Um, it's coming to uh, five minutes before the end of our discussion, which has been a very interesting discussion. And uh, you know, I have certainly uh, learned a lot and I sort of hate to wrap it up, but in, um, you know, in respect of everybody's time, <laughs> like uh, you know, everybody who's uh, watching us, we will do so. So I just want to ask um, everyone for sort of some closing thoughts. So you know, particularly like where if if you're on a project and you know, let's say it's a project that already exists, um, and uh, the the level of testing or the maturity of the testing isn't where you would like it to be, what is your sort of go-to method or yeah, where would you start if you'd like to you know each take that question in turn i should have told you in in which turn shouldn't i uh let's start with magnus all right um so uh, let's let's assume i i got a really big chunky problem um with no tests then I probably ask them, right, can you give me some input, uh, inputs and expected outputs? And then I'll, I'll probably start, start with those like a, an a integration type test and set up some test harness uh, to automatically run these tests and figure out how I can automatically uh, check that I get the, the same outputs. And then I, presumably we'll need to figure out how the code works anyway and and I'll start by looking at the bits uh, that I need to look at and and write the tests for that uh, Benjamin would you like to take next go sure so assuming that time is not infinite you're never going to be able to go back in and add tests to the level you would want from having actually written it from scratch in a reasonable time frame because that is an enormous ask so step one for me is like break down the code into its various components and start charting out you know what is the complexity of the component and what is its importance just make a little matrix position everything on there start with the most complex most important and work your way down and you want to just like as many test cases as you can quickly get together for big chunks of code. And then you go back, rearrange that graph and go like, okay, so these ones definitely have problems in, these ones may be trustworthy. So again, start from there, work your way down. Just try and maximize the value of the time you have available in terms of preventing as many potential bad outcomes as you can. All right, thank you, um, Alison. Um, so I think I'd sort of go along sort of Magnus's route, um, set up some CI, basically run what you've got, um, even if that's just, even if uh, you don't have any tests and you just have a script, check that you can run the script and it doesn't give you an error code at the end of it. That, that's kind of a, a really good like first step uh, for some sort of automated testing. And then I guess what I would do is, presumably I'd come along to actually make some changes to this code. I would test everything that I changed and just start to build it up that way. Because yeah, I think it, it it's too much to do everything at once. So just a sort of incremental approach, make sure that everything that you change is tested and then you will gradually make really good inroads into to, to testing that piece of software. 
Hey, thank you. And uh, Doug. Um, Graham, with great respect, uh, we have an election going on here today. And we learned over our campaign over the last little while that if a politician doesn't like the question, they ignore it and say what they want to say. And that's kind of what I'm going to do, which is a message that I didn't get out through the talk, which is I am both an API user and an API developer provider. And what drives me insane is variations and use of the word deprecate. Um, when someone provides a feature in a version one and then comes along in version two and says, yeah, that facility is deprecated, not don't use it anymore, just change your code to do this instead. I have far better things to do than to go back on every program I've ever written and keep track of every change to every library that was ever created and that I ever used and fill in the blanks and make the changes. API providers, if you're going to do that, you should have the onus on you to keep that, I call it upward compatibility. If it worked today, the old IBM saying it should work into the future. And, and so that's my little sermon for the morning is as an API provider, um, I want to make a commitment that, again, if it worked today, it should work into the future. Nothing strikes fear into my heart more than coming into a presentation and seeing a message, Microsoft has downloaded new updates to your machine. It needs to restart to in finish installing them. Oh my God. Um, what's going to work at the end of the day? And how long is it going to take me to recover from this? So that's that's all upward compatibility. It drives me crazy when, when things break that are beyond my control. <laughs> I hope we've all got testing. I, I hope we've all got a little upset dug on our shoulder when we're planning our uh, <laughs> API versioning strategies. Well, so um that is our time. So thank you very much uh, to the panelists, Allison, Benjamin, Doug, and Magnus. Uh, I have been and continue to be Graham Lee, despite the protests from uh, those who get in touch um thank you to chris and to all of the conference organizers and to everybody who's in the uh the session there has been some very good discussion uh on the slack so i will go and check that out after the session uh, thank you very much everyone goodbye thank you that was great